Good afternoon, everyone. It's such an incredible pleasure to see so many people here on this rather ordinary Canberra afternoon. Um, my name's Katrina Jackson. I'm the CEO of Science and Technology Australia, and we're really, really pleased to welcome you all here and our absolutely, I'm sorry, I'll say it, stellar panel this evening. Um, firstly, I need to thank the Inspiring Australia program and the Federal uh, Department of Industry, <coughs> excuse me, for their support of this event. Also, ANU Research Services have been very supportive. It doesn't cost nothing to put these things on, on as I'm sure you'll appreciate. At STA, our mission is to enhance and to promote the role of science to parliamentarians, to the community, to people like you, and also to politicians, sorry, parliamentarians, the community, and to industry. This kind of event is one of the ways in which we do that, and it's great to see it so well attended. Um, today our job isn't too hard with a topic as big and as almost inconceivably complex and fantastic as the Square Kilometre Array. Um, in a moment we'll, we'll begin the panel discussion, but for a second, oh sorry, telephone's off, anyone who's got a telephone in their pocket please make sure it turns off, nothing more embarrassing than having your phone ring right in the middle of a panel event. Uh, as I said, we're delighted to bring you four enormously talented speakers today, but before we get on to them, let's immerse ourselves in the SKA. Humans have always been drawn to the mysteries of the night sky. On clear nights, we can see thousands of stars and galaxies with our naked eyes alone. Optical telescopes have allowed us to see millions more and taught us much of what we know about the universe by collecting the light that finds its way to Earth from space. More recently, radio telescopes have enabled us to gather radio waves from space, providing a view of a universe filled with gas and exotic physical processes in more detail than ever before. Modern technology is now driving a rapid expansion of the capability of radio telescopes, and with it, their potential for new and exciting discoveries. For decades, scientists and engineers from all over the world have been developing a radio telescope so large and powerful that it will be able to see almost all the way back to the beginning of the universe. This telescope is known as the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, a project so ambitious that it will skip a generation in the development of radio telescopes. The SKA will be constructed in two places, Southern Africa and Australia and will be made up of millions of antennas of different types linked together by fibre optic networks and feeding data into huge supercomputers. Australia's SKA site at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory in Outback Western Australia will host two different arrays, each forming a component of the SKA and designed to tell us different things about our universe. The SKA survey array will be made up of 96 dish-type antennas and will be able to survey large areas of the sky at once with unprecedented speed and accuracy. Each of its dishes will stand three stories tall and they will be spread out in a spiral formation over an area up to 100 kilometers in diameter. The other array to be built in Australia is the Low Frequency Array, comprising millions of chest-high dipole antennas which will be spread out in clusters over a similar sized area. The Low Frequency Array will collect radio waves from the farthest reaches of space that have stretched out and shifted from high to lower frequency waves as the universe has expanded. Phase 1 will see over 200,000 of these antennas placed in the Australian outback, extending to around 5 million antennas by 2020. When fully operational, these two Australia-based arrays will generate staggering quantities of data. And by doing this, they will help us provide answers to some of humanity's oldest and most profound questions about the universe around us. All of the data gathered by the SKA in Australia will be correlated and packaged up on site before travelling via a dedicated high capacity fibre optic connection to the coastal city of Geraldton and then on to Perth over 700 kilometres away. In Perth, the data will be processed at the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre, an innovative and purpose-built supercomputer facility. The sheer volume of data generated by the SKA will require a supercomputer faster and more powerful than any currently in existence. Though construction of Phase 1 of the SKA project is not due to begin until the latter half of this decade, 
the Australian core site is already home to two SKA precursor telescopes. Testing and developing technology for the SKA, these are both state-of-the-art radio telescopes in their own right. The Australian SKA Pathfinder Telescope, or ASCAP, built by Australia's CSIRO, is a 36-dish survey array, which will be expanded to form the full SKA survey array by the beginning of the next decade. ASCAP can capture images from an area of the sky 30 times larger than previous radio receivers, thanks to its revolutionary phased array feed receiver technology, a feature which helps it to survey large areas of the sky quickly and accurately. The Murchison Wide Field Array, or MWA telescope, a collaboration between several international universities and organisations, is designed to pick up low frequency radio waves from deep space. It is already doing groundbreaking science and the lessons being learned in its design and construction will help to inform the design of the SKA Low Frequency Array. Both the ASCAP and the MWA are on the brink of making discoveries and breaking records in radio astronomy. Both are already playing important roles in the development of the world's largest telescope the SKA and Australia as proud co-host of the SKA looks forward to playing a key role in its development helping to unlock the secrets of the universe Katrina, thank you so much. I'm Genevieve Jacobs from 666 ABC Canberra. It's a great pleasure to be here in this jam-packed lecture theatre with this very distinguished panel. I'm always amused by the tweeting. We have a sign in the green room at the ABC that says the green room is the space where people wait to go on the radio. Don't just sit there, tweet. <laughs> I'm always amused by that. Don't get a glass of water. Don't go to the loo. Tweet, for goodness sake. So if you do, then do so. And it is a real pleasure to see in this audience in front of me a whole group of people who are prepared for their minds to be stretched and a panel who are just the scientists to do so. We are here to talk about the Square Kilometre Array, one of the most ambitious, extraordinary and breathtaking projects in recent times. The scope is almost unthinkable, one that has unlimited capability. In fact, it occurred to me as I was reading about this that this is almost science fiction fans nirvana, isn't it? The Big Bang, life on other planets, black holes, Einstein, but with the killer key fact that we are dealing in the truth, in facts, in knowledge, rather than imagination. The very role of the Square Kilometre Array is to unlock the secrets of the universe, but I think the thing is so big that it's almost hard to know where to begin. Much of this, though, today is about you. It's quite possible that I'm the person in the room who knows least about this, so I am relying on you for your questions. And the popularity of this event does show me very clearly how fascinated people are by this attempt to push to the absolute limits of human knowledge and exploration. So I hope that you are very well prepared and we are ready to launch into questions almost immediately. As Katrina said, we have roving microphones on both sides and I just ask you to signal to those people to get the microphone to you and wait until you have the microphone before you answer your question. As Katrina said, please do turn mobiles off or silence them, but first let me introduce you to our panel. Professor Brian Schmidt, to my left, is a Laureate Fellow and Distinguished Professor at the Australian National University. His undergraduate degrees in Astronomy and Physics were from the University of Arizona, where he also completed his Master's degree, and his PhD was taken at Harvard in 1993. You all know that he's kicked some absolutely extraordinary scientific goals. Under his leadership in 1998, the high Z supernova research team made the startling discovery that the expansion rate of the universe is accelerating, and it was that work that earned him the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the United States Academy of Science, and the Royal Society, and he was made a Companion of the Order of Australia in 2013. Dr. Lisa Harvey-Smith is a research astronomer at the CSIRO's Astronomy and Space Science Division in Sydney. She uses radio telescopes to study cosmic magnetic fields, the birth of massive stars, and the formation of planetary nebulae and supernova remnants in our galaxy. Lisa is the project scientist for the $180 million ASCAP telescope, 
and her role includes planning ASCAP's early science program, taking part in commissioning and ensuring that science goals and engineering developments remain aligned. She also played a key role in securing Australia's position as a host nation for the $2 billion SKA radio telescope. Lisa has been a passionate communicator on the SKA. She gives around 30 public lectures a year and contributes regularly to radio and television and the printed media. On the end, but by no means bringing up the rear, Professor Brian Boyle, who is the Square Kilometre Array Director for the Department of Industry, following his role as the CSIRO's SKA Director. Previously, he was Director of the CSIRO Australia Telescope National Facility until 2009, where he initiated the construction of the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, that's ASCAP that I referred to just a moment ago uh, with Lisa, and he's been Director of the Anglo-Australian Observatory. His main research interests are cosmology, active galactic nuclei and quasars. He's overseen the successful commissioning of world-class instruments and has led many international scientific collaborations. As chairman of the National Committee for Astronomy, he led the development of the Decadal Plan for Australian Astronomy, 2006 to 15, and he was also the facilitator for the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Investment Plan for Optical and Radio Astronomy. They've got great CVs, haven't they? <laughs> they don't come much better. Brian Boyle, I want to start with you with the most obvious question. What is this? What's it for? It's for unlocking our position in the universe. It's a, a grand design that would make Kevin MacLeod cry his eyes out. <laughs> it's an opportunity to place Australia in a, in a global context, working with our global partners. It's an opportunity to work with Nobel Prize winners, to work with people who invented wireless technology that you're all losing right now. Probably shouldn't be, but if you have to tweet, I don't know how you t turn your ph phones off and tweet at the same time, so that's a, <laughs> that's a good one, Genevieve. It's an opportunity to work with people like that to build the world's most exciting piece of scientific infrastructure in the 21st century to generate opportunities for the next Nobel Prize winners and the next people who will invent the new wireless LAN. Who wouldn't want to do a project like this? Mm. Brian Schmidt, how big is this in international terms? How significant is this development? So uh, we all hear about the Large Hadron Collider, mm. which is the big uh, device at CERN that unlocked the sort of one of the last uh, issues within particle physics, the Higgs boson. This is of that scale. It really is the big thing coming up in astronomy. We have the James Webb Space Telescope, and then after that we um, are going to have the Square Kilometer Array. So it is as big as science gets, and it is something that I think the world is waiting to happen because it's really a new technology there. We can essentially use computers instead of giant dishes uh, to make things work better, faster, cheaper, and in this case, a hundred times more powerfully than ever before. Mm. Uh, Lisa, what's the relevance of this for Australian science, that this is taking place here in this country? Well, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, I, when I watch that video, by the way, I get chills down my spine <laughs> still. I must have seen it a hundred times, but you know, if it's that exciting to me as a radio astronomer, you know, it, it's the incomprehensible scale of it. Um, is really hard to explain. But in terms of Australia's role, um, Australia's been a real key player in radio astronomy for the last 50 to 60 years. In fact, um, you know, in that time, Australia's um, built the Parkes Radio Telescope, the Deep Space uh, Network is here. You know, everyone knows the, the, the dish, the movie, um, based on the tr beaming of the moon landing images uh, through that through that facility. And um, we have a number of other radio telescopes across the country. So, in fact, um, Australia is already punching well above its weight in, in radio astronomy. And that's why I came here from the UK, because the CSIRO um, Australia Telescope facility was, was known worldwide as one of the best. Um, uh, and this is just uh, expanding this into the next 50 years. So the Square Kilometre Array will be around for at least 50 years. It will have a, an upgrade path, so the telescopes, the big dishes, um, uh, uh, the sort of the obvious part of the the telescope, but the as as Brian said, the the computer technology and the the new r radio receivers that are being invented now can be upgraded into the future, just as just as we've done with the giant 
Parks Radio Dish. We've invented new receivers, better electronics, better computer technologies, better software, and we've continued to build upon you know, the, the sheer metal, um, which is the, the dish that you see. Mm. Brian Boyle, tell me how this fits into the notion of, of big science. What does science mean by that notion? I think big science means different things to different people. So I will say what I think of big science. Big science to me means a global partnership. It means that the types of instruments that we need in order to understand either the world or the universe around us are of increasing scale and increasing cost. And that really focuses us to work with other people because they're of a scale that no one nation can afford. And I think in itself that is really important. And for me, one of the biggest kicks I get is to working with my colleagues around the world, not only sharing my scientific knowledge, but sharing my technical knowledge as well. And for Australia, with 1.5% of the world's intellectual property, the opportunity to leverage 98.5% out there is really, really important. You might have seen those dishes of the Australian SKE Pathfinder. It's my absolute privilege to have negotiated the deal with a Chinese company to build those dishes. And it's not just buying antennas from China, it's licensing CSRO technology back to China in manufacturing that then yields further benefits for Australia. So big science to me means global science. Mm. Uh, Brian Schmidt, does the SKA fulfil a specific need that currently exists or is this kind of enormous potential we've heard about mean that we are building it to find out what it can do? Well, whenever you build a scientific instrument, you're always building it for a few things that you know you can do. So in our case, we want to look back to the time right after the Big Bang, before there were stars, before there were galaxies. We know we want to do that. And so we have this grand design of something. But then when you get there along the way, of course, it's, what you, it's the unknown unknowns that you are able to unlock suddenly with this new piece of equipment. It might be a new version of the World Wide Web or something that CERN brought us. But it might also be a discovery, scientific discovery, which we just can't contemplate. So it's a little bit of both. You have the goals, but you also have the opportunity to do things you just can't dream of in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, what, what are the first things that we'll be able to do? What, what's the immediate capacity as this comes online? Well, the, the Australian SKA Pathfinder, for which I'm the project scientist, um, is really prototyping the, the new camera technology that CSIRO has built. Um, so one of the first things you can do there is, is go from the current state in radio astronomy where you are um, staring for a very long time at a single piece of sky. So say we're interested in studying a galaxy and uh, we would point the telescopes at that galaxy normally for 12 hours. We would just open the shutter uh, for 12 hours and, and we would record the information and we would make a, a picture and a, and a spectrum of that galaxy and, and find out information. Um, the new technology that um, we've designed and built on the, on the ASCAP telescope allows you to open up 30 times greater field of view. So it's like putting a wide angle lens on a camera. Um, so instead of taking a picture of part of the Sydney Opera House, you, you would see the entire vista, the Harbour Bridge would all be in, in that one photograph. So, um, so the first thing that, that, that we want to do um, in the ASCAP science program is to take pictures of the whole sky. And that is um, with a sensitive telescope, instead of uh, measuring individual objects, you, you do a huge census. Um, so it's almost like writing a dictionary. And um, we will probably in the first year be able to see 600,000 galaxies like our own galaxy uh, and measure the amount of gas in those galaxies. And the gas is the stuff that makes the stars. So stars are made out of gravity pulling gas together. So we can actually weigh the galaxy. We can find out how fast it's rotating. That means we can um, find out things about the unseen matter in the galaxy. And we can compare that to images from other telescopes, optical telescopes, infrared telescopes, and find out about the chemistry of those galaxies and really understand uh, a, a, a sort of a new layer on top of our current understanding. I am stuck at 600,000 galaxies. I'm just, that's astonishing. Let's, let's talk for a moment before we open the floor up about some of those specific tasks that, that, uh, that the SKA will be able to do. Um, uh, Brian Schmidt, um, you mentioned a moment ago this glimpse back to the origins of well, time and space, this, this idea that we can travel back to just after the Big Bang. I, I imagine it's the $64 million question, but how do you do that? Well, you know, we live in a universe which is 13.8 billion years old. And that is a very profound statement that means there is an edge to what, you know, where things began. It means that the universe is growing old, not like, unlike myself. 
And so that means if we can look a long ways away, and with a very powerful radio telescope you can, you're actually looking back in time. And indeed, the people at the back side of the room are about 50 nanoseconds old, as opposed to the ones in the front, which are only four or five. So already that's happening, except for nanoseconds aren't very long, so we don't really notice it. So, for example, the square kilometer array will go through and look back to a time when the universe was created out of hydrogen and helium. There were no stars and galaxies, and that hydrogen, it turns out, emits radio waves. And the Murchison Wide Field Array, that's the other prototype, the one that has these little, uh, you know, looks like a bunch of coat hangers. Uh, that's a project I'm involved in. And that is a project which will be able to, we hope, it's a very difficult measurement, get the first glimpses of that hydrogen that existed in the universe before there were stars and galaxies. Mm -hmm. And that transition that the universe makes from being a very boring, empty place to being the quite amazing place we live in today, represented by this room among everything else, that's something we don't really yet understand. And the pathfinders will give the glimpse, the square kilometer array will allow us to just literally see how the universe was born. Mm. And so that's why I'm, I guess I'm so excited about it. Mm. This is a process of working back by equations almost, of if, if this, then this, then that, and so that's So it's equations, but it's actually yeah. seeing, because yes. okay. yeah. that, 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 that hydrogen, it's been that the radio waves have been traveling, mm. you know, for 13.7 billion years. The universe is about 100 million years. So you can literally see it. It's not just equations. It's actually seeing, but with radio eyes, not optical eyes. Mm. Uh, Lisa, you mentioned the 600,000 galaxies. Uh, this also goes to the conditions for life on other planets, because we now know immensely more about what's out there beyond our own systems than we did even 20 or 30 years ago. So how can the SKA pinpoint the possibility of, of other life forms? Well, that's right. Um, in 1990, we, when I was first getting enthusiastic about astronomy as a kid, we didn't know any other planets outside of our solar system. When they were went out to Pluto, which was then a planet, and, um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the good old days. Eh? Well, uh, I, I voted for it. I voted for Pluto as a planet at the IU. I want that to go on record. Right? Yeah, I was one of the well minority. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So that we was, were in the minority. That was my first Go conference. On. That was a good one. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, yeah, so other, other than the nine planets in the solar system, which there were at the time, there were no other planets known around other stars. And now we know over a thousand because, you know, we put a telescope up into space and, and had a look. And, um, and the SKA, um, as, as we've said, is, is a radio telescope. Um, you can actually see radio waves from planets, like Jupiter has an aurora, just like the aurora australis or aurora borealis on the Earth. So um, we can actually see bursts of radio uh, waves on other planets, potentially. We can also uh, look at the way planets are forming around other stars. So just like the rings of Saturn, uh, beautiful rings of tiny rocks and dust and debris, and then larger rocks around Saturn. We think that planets form around stars in the same way. They, they form these kind of rings, and then those form planetary systems, just like our own solar system. So with the, the square kilometer array, we'll potentially be able to actually see those planetary systems forming around other stars, which is uh, absolutely incredible. And amazingly, we'll be able to measure from the wavelength of the light that we're, that we're receiving at the telescope, we'll be able to measure the size of the little pebbles or boulders or rocks uh, as they're growing at different parts of the the, the system, the planetary system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there's the the other sort of more pop science, um, but potentially viable scientific project of filing, finding intelligent life or signs of technological civilizations around other stars. Um, if we put one of our powerful airport radars uh, on a planet a few light years away, we would see it with the square kilometer array. So there could just be incidental emissions from civilizations getting on with things, you know, having radio shows like you do, um, <laughs> having airports, um, military radar, things like that. They could just be leaking off into space and, and we would see them. Mm. Brian Boyle, um, these are extraordinary things to be grappling with. How do you expect the SKA to change our understanding of the universe? Well, my understanding of the universe has, has just changed about two minutes ago uh, <laughs> with Brian Schmidt. I mean, the Schmidt principle, you will always look younger to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm gonna, I may only be nanoseconds, but I'm going I'm to hold on to that particular one, I tell you. Sorry, sorry, Brian. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, that's perhaps the greatest thing the SK will ever do is something we haven't even thought about. The universe is not only queerer than we imagine, it's queerer than we can imagine. Mm. The, I think Haldane said that, the British sociologist said that. And I think there's nothing more true. Uh, Brian alluded to it. I mean, when Brian went out to, if Brian had told his uh, academic peer review groups he was going to look, uh, go out and look for dark energy uh, when he started, they would have come and taken him away in little white coats. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the, it's the inspiring scientists like the Brian's, like the Lisa's of this world that will have you know, crazy notions that will turn out to be completely different. I think that is the greatest scientific breakthrough the SKA will make because it is something we haven't thought of. Mm -hmm. And the real challenge with the grand design of the SKA is to build an instrument that is so versatile and so extreme in its capabilities, it can actually do science and, and be used in ways you haven't thought of. Scientists dream dreams, but engineers make them happen. Mm. And in the SK, mm. we've got some fantastic engineers. It's going to make not only the dreams that scientists dream happen, but some of the dreams they've not yet had happen. Mm. Brian Schmidt, Einstein is absolutely foundational to modern physics. Do you expect the SKA to confirm his theories? Do you expect that the SKA might throw up things which really challenge some fundamentals of modern physics as we understand it? Well, we can always hope. Uh, one thing that uh, <laughs> science is all about is challenging what you know, and nothing is taken for granted. So there are some tests of, of general relativity, which is Einstein's grand theory, built into what the square kilometer array can do through uh, pulsars, which are these uh, essentially tiny little stars we call neutron stars that put out little pulses of light. They're the best clocks in the universe, and you have these clocks strewn around the universe you can use them to do very fancy tests of fundamental physics. Now, it may well be that, uh, you know, Einstein in this regime has the right answer. It may be that there are problems. So that's why you're testing. Mm. And I, I just don't know. You don't know things until you, you try them out. And that's ultimately what we're doing in science. We're out trying our, our ideas. Because when you have an idea figured out that, you know, and you can then test it and say, does it work? That, that's what knowledge is. That's what re our version of reality is. It's a set of ideas that we use to predict things. And as long as things get, are predicted, you think you understand what's going on. You think you know what's real. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're all about. It's when things suddenly can't be predicted that you have interesting, you realize that you don't understand things. You're not sure what reality is. And that happens an awful lot in science, uh, and certainly happened in 1998 when we suddenly discovered that the universe was speeding up. You realize that, geez, we didn't know what was going on, and it's taken 15 years, and we sort of have it sorted out. We have to make up 95% of the universe, but don't worry about that. Uh, so my, my uh, along with what uh, Big Brian, as well you like to call him in the business, uh, says, uh, I don't quite know what the square kilometer array is going to turn up, mm -hmm. but I suspect it will change our knowledge in some fundamental way, but not in a way I can dream up mm -hmm. in advance. Uh, I'm going to open the floor to questions in just a moment, but before we do that, uh, Brian Ball, I did just want to ask you about the one aspect we haven't touched on so far, and that's the incredible scale of computing developments that go alongside this project development. There are massive data processing requirements and enormous implications for technology that come from that processing, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a telescope of astronomical superlatives when it comes to the computing and engineering. Uh, I could tell you that the computer that we're going to build is 100 times faster than anything in existence today. It's capable of 1 million, million, million operations per second. Or the data that will be carried by the uh, data pipes between the telescopes will be 10 times minimum the current global internet traffic. Now those numbers start boggling, or they boggle my mind. Uh, they're difficult to visualize. Imagine a telescope in one hour generating enough material to fill a stack of DVDs a kilometer high. Because that's what you're looking at at the moment. Uh, we, have to, we have to power that. Or a telescope that will generate more information in one day than the total amount of information spoken by humanity, ever. <laughs> That's five million, million, million bytes of information. Ah, um, we are talking about what we call the exadomain. That's million, million, millions, whether they're bytes, whether they're information per second. And the great thing about it is to work with industry. 
and challenge industry in order to work with the research to build these things. And, and a, a famous, a famous uh, computer company, I can't mention who they are, but they have a three-letter acronym, uh, <laughs> tell me that, sure, we can build the, the computer that will uh, power the SK and will deliver it to you in 2020, and it will be a Thursday. I admire their confidence. <laughs> let's, let's go now to your questions. We've got uh, two microphones around the room. And if you could just put your hands up uh, so that we can spot you and get, you get the microphones to you. I think we've got a couple of questions. We might go down here first. And uh, we'll just get the microphone to you and then a question further at the back. And we are recording this, of course, so please do wait until the microphone gets to you so we can hear you clearly. Go ahead. I'm a lay person, but a technical question. We're familiar with the deep space three positions around the globe to avoid blind spots. I'm curious as to the sighting of the two SKAs in South Africa and Australia. Um, is there a conscious decision to only look at the southern hemisphere? And do we anticipate a third one somewhere around the other side to take our blind spots? Could you clear that up for me? And do these two current planned SKAs work in serial? or in tandem? Shall I yeah. just take some? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so the, the Southern Hemisphere um, was chosen, was preferred uh, as a site for the Square Kilometre Array simply because we live in a galaxy uh, and therefore most of the interesting things in the, in the near field that we can see uh, are within our galaxy. Of course, there's a whole big universe out there that, that we're interested in. And there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and that happens to be only visible from the southern sky. Um, so that was one of the driving reasons um, to have the SK in the southern hemisphere. But there are lots of other reasons um, that those two sites were particularly good. There's obviously less land mass in the southern hemisphere, so there are fewer choices. Um, but that's a good thing because the population density in a lot of those areas, such as remote Western Australia and the Karoo Desert in South Africa, is, is much less than, say, Europe. And the popula population density is very important because people and all the trappings of technology, everything we use, uh, computers, uh, even cars, mobile phones, all that stuff emits radio waves. And we're listening for very, very faint radio signals from space. So if we're anywhere near any civilization, any towns, villages, farms, that kind of thing, we, we would be drowned out. The telescope signals would be drowned out by those um, signals from, from people and our technology. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of other reasons, uh, sort of space weather reasons, um, why certain areas of the world are much more suitable than others. So it's quite a complicated decision to make um, where to site the telescope. Um, but from a combination of those factors, um, the southern hemisphere seemed like a, a, a preferable place. Okay, and I think we've got another question up here. If I, if I so, could just, sorry. there was, there was another part to the questions. Yeah, sure. one of these three or four oh. part questions. I think you also asked a, a bit about will they be used together? By and large, no, they won't be used together. They're actually looking at certain different uh, frequency ranges of the radio spectrum, so they'll actually be used apart. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, to be honest, there was a degree of political expediency as well as sharing it between South Africa and Australia. And we went through a very long and uh, tense uh, site selection campaign. And I think we've ended up with the best possible uh, solution as a result. Okay. I will just continue to say that if we can build another one in the Northern Hemisphere, that would clear up that blind spot. But I think we want to, th these are very expensive instruments, and so uh, we're already asking for a fair bit of money. And, uh, that how is how a much is this all costing? And who's paying? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. There will be a whip round afterwards. Uh, <laughs> there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, the, event, the first phase, which is about 10% of the telescope, will cost uh, construction costs of 650 million euros. Uh, so it's um, not inexpensive, but in terms of scales of large hadron colliders and mm. mega science projects, mm -hmm. it's uh, not bargain basement, but I think it's mm. of good value. The full SK telescope. I'd like to say the sky's the limit. Uh, currently, the projections are around about 2 billion euros. Mm. But it's the cumulative effect as much as anything, isn't it? So it's not, as you say, that things like the Large Hadron Collider, which is the complex t technology all in one. This is the replication over large distances that That's makes right. it so effective. Yeah. And there are, there are 10 countries currently involved in it. Uh, and so the, the, the cost of that will be spread across those 10 countries at the moment, and more are looking to join. Okay, now to the gentleman up here. Uh, question for the panel. Um, last week, an American group s announced that they detected um, 
gravitational wave down using a telescope installed down in the on the South Pole, I think. Um, might we expect SCAR, when it's operational, to do similar things in, in the area of gravitational waves? Tell us more about gravitational waves. And um, the announcement that was made last week, people are already whispering about Nobel Prizes. So if I could have a bit of insight on maybe Brian Schmidt would be the more qualified to say yep. about that. <laughs> All right, so the BICEP2 experiment, as it was known, uh, last week, a week announced I think a somewhat surprising detection of what we would call gravity waves. Uh, so these are ripples in space, literally caused by the instant after the Big Bang. And this showed up in what we call the cosmic microwave background and was itself made with effectively a radio telescope array at the South Pole. Uh, so I will say, having talked to several experts, there is a small chance this result is spurious. And it, we need to wait and see. But if true, let's assume it's true. It is very exciting and essentially allows us to look back at how the universe was born. But the square kilometer array will be trying to detect these same gravitational waves, or I should say, not these gravitational waves, but gravitational waves from, for example, supermassive black holes that uh, merge together. It would be a direct detection of actually seeing space do the little accordion. Now, we have already inferred through radio telescopes that these gravity waves exist through pulsars. And so the detection of gravity waves itself was not the big thing. I think the media sort of got it wrong. The big thing was being able to look back right after the Big Bang. So the square kilometer ray has the possibility of directly detecting gravity waves through essentially seeing space um, get a ripple through it, meaning that the things that direction and that direction become delayed in time by a little bit, by a tiny fraction of a second. But it also allows us to do different types of physics, to look at how black holes are growing across the universe, uh, how these things, when they do uh, come together, two, imagine, two supermassive black holes, a uh, hundred million times bigger than our sun, two of them coming together. Now, talking about pushing physics to its limit, we think that happens. Uh, we don't know how to see those things right now, but they will emit an amazing gravity wave signal, which the square kilometer ray, for example, might be able to help detect. And so it's different physics, it's related, but uh, it's not any less interesting uh, because of that detection, potentially even more. Okay. Uh, and here, yeah. Yeah, um, a little bit of a story, just to put it into perspective. A million years ago, a supernova explodes. Um, 50,000 years ago, the light finally hits the Earth, and a caveman sees it and says the UG equivalent of, gee, that was bright, <laughs> and then goes back to hunting the woolly mammoth. <laughs> we will never see that explosion ever again. It's gone. It's past us. It's out yeah. there somewhere. And yet, everyone's saying that we're seeing back to the Big, big Bang, 100 million years after the Big Bang, you know, trillions yeah. of a second after the Big Bang. How's that possible? What, hasn't it passed us already? Or is it such a huge thing that we're actually seeing it on the opposite side of the universe? Or, yep. but how's that because it's a space stretch and all okay. those questions? Thank you. Uh, you want me to take this? Please. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you, don't, you don't have to be a Zen Buddhist to be an astronomer, but it helps. You know, it, it, does, it does help. So the difference between the supernova, that supernova is in one place at one time. I see you right now 15 nanoseconds after you speak, and you know you move, and I see you at any given time at that distance. So a supernova, its light's traveling, goes past us, and it'll keep on going on, and assuming someone, there isn't a mirror up the other direction, we have no chance of ever seeing it again. Now, the case of the universe, where you're looking back, you're looking back at a universe that goes on and on and on and on. And you know, people always ask, where was the Big Bang? But the Big Bang is right here. Mm. But it was right there, right there. It was everywhere at the same time. That is the thing that the entire universe has in common. That time, 13.8 billion years ago, when things got really, were really, really hot and everything was expanding very quickly apart. So the reason why we look back to the time of the Big Bang is because there's a universe to look at. Imagine that the universe wasn't much, much bigger than what we can see. Imagine it was, you know, looked like a pizza with an edge. 
then we wouldn't see the Big Bang because we'd run out of universe. I don't even know what that means, but there has to be stuff out there. And indeed, to really bend your mind, is there's a whole bunch of universe further away than 13.8 billion light years in travel distance that almost certainly exists, but we cannot actually ever see because the light will never ever reach us. Mm -hmm. And so, it does it really exist? Well, that's a sort of this, the tree falls in the forest, no one hears it type question. Well, I would say it probably does, but I can never test it. And that starts getting that philosophical nature of what's reality. Mm -hmm. um, at the very back of the room. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you discussed a little bit about the, the computing power and the amount of data that's going to be streaming out of these uh, arrays. What I'd like to know is, are you going to store all this raw data? And if so, how and where? Mm. Brian Ball? That's a really, really good question. And I think it goes to the heart of some of the engineering challenges around this telescope. No, we can't possibly store <gasps> all the data. Um, the one telescope you saw in the image there, the Murchison Wide Field Array, actually does manage to store all its data, but it can't possibly then uh, process it in real time. It's a bit like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. You know, you just cannot process that volume of data that quickly. And so when the, the Murchison Wide Field Array stops operating, there'll be several years' worth of data that's being stored for bright, smart, young students to come along and actually analyse. In the SKA, uh, the cost of data storage we project, because again, we, we can't, we're, all, we're dealing in computer projections, is likely to be far more expensive than we can afford to buy to store. So we will have to make decisions about what we keep in terms of the telescope. But of course, the interesting thing is that in future, you're not going to be building new telescopes. When you think of a telescope, you might think of the, the dish or the, the little antennas. We're actually going to be building new computers that will allow us to keep more data and store more data. So we'll do new science by building new computers, not by building new telescopes. Mm. Uh, look, uh, please do put your hand up because we've got two microphones on either side of the room so and plenty of time for more questions. So uh, over here and over here. Um, so I think we've got a question up the back there. But just before that, uh, Brian Ball, how much longer before the project is fully on stream? So construction of the Square Kilometre Array is scheduled to start in 2017. Uh, and I would imagine as it's built out, because it's kind of built from a, you know, almost a kit form in terms of modular, uh, we'll start seeing the first science results coming from the SKA by the end of this decade. And of course, we have science results already flowing from the two SKA precursors at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, the Murchison Wide Field Array, uh, and ASCAP, who's currently commissioning. Mm. And there would be very considerable implications for Australian technology developments through this enormous amount of data processing. Absolutely. And, and in other areas, we're now dealing in an innovative power solutions to cool the POSI supercomputer centre that's finding applications in industrial-scale cooling elsewhere. CSIR are using... Uh, a yacht manufacturer to build radio frequency interference shields. Uh, so there's a, a new manufacturing uh, application. The, um, the, Mer the, the, the Murchison Widefield Array, the, the, the new prototype for the SKA low telescopes, the Christmas trees, are being made by a clothesline manufacturer. Uh, <laughs> Hills Hoist, Hills Hoist. the desert. <laughs> I am not, uh, look, I'm not saying it's a Hills Hoist like the public, uh, but you never know. All right, not far off maybe. <laughs> now the question we had up the back here. Yep. Um, we mentioned uh, dark energy uh, earlier on in the conversation. Are dark energy and dark matter a done deal now? Or is there a possibility they're going to go the way of the ether and epicycles? Well, uh, <laughs> I guess that is the big question. Uh, my Nobel Prize was, was discovering the accelerating universe, not for discovering dark energy. That being said, uh, in 1998, when we made that discovery, uh, the community could make predictions based on that model about things they would see in the future. Since 1998, so that's, uh, you know, in the previous, in the, in the past 16 years, every experiment we've been able to do, and some of them make very elaborate predictions, has been borne out by that model. That is, that model of dark matter and dark energy. And so although we don't understand what dark matter and dark energy are very well, uh, they are incredibly predictive of what we do see in the universe. And that comes down to that notion of reality again. Are Newton's laws of gravity wrong? Well, they're not perfect, but 
Who here in this audience, when I'm going to drop this glass, mm -hmm. thinks of it in a relativistic fashion? <laughs> I don't. You don't. If I did, I'd never be able to realize that the thing hits the ground. It's too complicated. So we still teach Newton's laws because they're useful, and they represent a version of reality that we all think of how gravity works. General relativity, well, OK, it works and can do that as well. But we need to use that when we talk about things like black holes. It doesn't mean that Newton's laws are wrong. It means that there's a more sophisticated way of looking at the universe uh, that we can use. So it may well be, and I suspect it probably will be, that we will come up with a more sophisticated way of describing dark matter and dark energy. But I think you will find, or I'm willing to bet, not a lot of money in this case, uh, <laughs> that we will probably stick with the notion of dark matter and dark energy in the same way that we persist with Newton's laws. It's a convenient way to visualize what's going on in the universe. It, but the, it strikes me that the SKI's great value too is that you will be able to, this is, this is observational science as much as theoretical science. So, oh, absolutely. You know, and and that's, that's the great gift so of being able to. So you'll be able to go to, through and yeah. test these mm. things and, as I said, redefine uh, reality if, if we start making observations that are wrong compared to our predictions, then we know we've got something wrong and we have to revise. That's how, you know, everything from that, you know, our clothes to our video cameras have come into existence, really, is through that process of science. Mm -hmm. but that, that's where this telescope comes it, into its own again, because it's, it's doing a drift net trawling the universe mm -hmm. survey, finding, let's say, a billion galaxies. You can actually find the, the positions and the motions and the clumpiness of those galaxies and the, the shapes in which they arrange themselves and the amount of clumpiness, and that mm. tells you a lot about these invisible components of the universe. And how they bend each other's light and things mm. as well, well. It also makes possible new theoretical developments, doesn't it? Absolutely. Things that arise from those observations. Uh, and we find more, more mm. mysteries. And, and I think the questioner has absolutely got it spot on. We as scientists have to guard, but humanity has to guard against generational chauvinism. Mm. That every generation thinks it's on the pinnacle of discovering you know, everything, that, that there's only a few things left to discover. <laughs> Who's <laughs> <laughs> tried to claim that uh, has been wrong mm. and will continue to be wrong. Mm. Mm. And as long as we can continue to challenge constructively, then we will progress. Mm. Uh, yes, the question here. Thank you. I was just wondering how you calibrate a new instrument like the SCAR. So if you see something you didn't expect to, what can you do to see that the instrument is actually working well? Mm -hmm. mm. That's an incredibly challenging thing. What we're doing at the moment is commissioning the Australian SKA Pathfinder telescope. So what we're doing in that case is we're getting uh, images from other radio telescopes that in some cases have taken, because the technology is not quite so advanced, has taken several years to actually gather the information about what the sky looks like at that frequency. And then we're applying that to the, the new images and comparing them, and obviously that you can do that. Um, but in some cases, as you say, we're doing completely new science. For example, um, because of the wide field of view of this telescope, we're taking a picture of the sky every five seconds. So no one's ever done that before, and very few people. And people are trying to do that with different telescopes around the world now to see what's changing in the sky and see if things are flashing on and off. Um, we talked about those pulsars earlier. Um, there are other phenomena, supernovae, gamma ray bursts, things we don't know about yet that we want to discover. And those are the really tricky things. It's getting an intelligent computer program to find things for us, things that we can't predict, things that are not behaving in a way that we expect. And that is our challenge. We don't know yet. Um, an interesting story to relate is it's a, really, it's a really important question because I remember when the Cambridge telescope was, was first switched on back in the 1960s, uh, they detected these things and they called them, they were, they were ticking regularly and they called them LGM1, Little Green Man 1. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we now know them slightly more prosaically as pulsars, as stars that pulse. But you're absolutely right, when you first switch on something, You've got a new telescope that's going into new areas of parameter space, actually not only confirming what you find, but understanding what you find is mm. going to be really exciting. Well, yeah, and understanding whether the machinery, the equipment itself is functioning correctly. Oh, abso absolutely. That's especially critical, if you this, isn't it? it never yeah. does initially. No. I can tell you that. <laughs> especially if you detect aliens, you want to be absolutely sure <laughs> that you... Uh, because then the media will be all over you. Yeah, it's yeah. shocking. Uh, up here, yeah. 
Uh, thank you. I just want to come back to the question of funding. Uh, we heard the UK science minister announce like two, two weeks ago that the UK is going to commit to, I think, 120 euros of funding for the SKA. And my question would be, are there other countries that have committed funding yet? And um, yeah, how uh, do you think there will be enough money to, to realize this project? Thank you. Yeah, again, another very good question. So currently, uh, the SK organization is looking at a funding model, and you're going to laugh at this. It's actually based at the number of astronomers in your country. Uh, it's, what we, <laughs> it's what we call a capacity proxy model. Your ability to benefit from it depends on the number of scientists that are going to apply to use it. So why not the number of astronomers? It's actually quite a well-defined number. International Astronomical Union that votes against Pluto also counts the number of astronomers in each country. <laughs> <laughs> so you end up with, uh, so the host countries currently, that is South Africa, Australia and the UK, are uh, planning to commit of the order of 14% each of the square kilometre array. Uh, so the UK have actually overcommitted. Uh, countries like Germany and Italy would put in 12%, countries like Canada 8%, the Dutch 6%, New Zealand, uh, 2%, uh, not the, uh, Sweden too, 2% as well. If you add all those up, you get 100%. Have they committed those numbers yet? No, they haven't. But the great thing about the UK's announcement and the support of the Australian and the South African governments in terms of the huge investment they've already put into scientific infrastructure at both the Murchison site and at the site in South Africa, the Karoo, uh, means that Australia, South Africa and the UK can together go to other countries of the SK and start uh, demanding money with menaces or whatever, <laughs> whatever we do at the political level. But, uh, so it's a tremendous, look, it's a fantastic, a fantastic news for the SK uh, that the UK have put this amount of money in. And uh, I'm actually quite confident that this will net now the, the money that we need in order to construct the SK. I should say that the, the current design phase is fully funded. And one of the remarkable things that even at a time of you know, significant global financial crisis, countries around the world have together, all those 10 countries have put in of the order of 200 million euros to design the telescope. And again, this goes to the business case of not only is it outstanding science, but it's great engineering and really very significant intellectual property being developed in the areas of IT, power management, manufacturing. Mm. And presumably that takes care of the long-term investment. If this thing has a 50-year lifespan, then you're looking at those ongoing economic effects to continue the funding for the, the, the basic operation. Absolutely. And we will be, we're at the moment writing the treaty that would bind the nations together to commit to funding this for 50 years. Okay. And, and other countries, I was just in, in the Netherlands last week and saw their plan for astronomy. And they're in the process of applying for funding from one of their big pots of money for specifically part of their funding of the build phase. So, uh, and, and that's going on in other countries as well. Mm. Uh, I think we've got a question up here at the top. I'll, I'll ask a question and perhaps there's no answer immediately available to it. Here we are talking about an amazing piece of technology using the intellectual capacities of people all around the world exploring this frontier of radio astronomy, this frontier of our galaxy, and yet we're sitting on a planet where for two weeks the world has been waiting with bated breath because of an airliner has disappeared off the, off the face of the map. Uh, do you find that incongruous and do you have any observations? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, so, the world is funny. There are things, y you'd be amazed what you can figure out when you go out and you look. The problem with the airliner is it kind of caught us by surprise and you know it's kind of hard to reconstruct things when you didn't have anything you know looking. The universe is different. It's out there. It doesn't normally change that much. Sometimes it does and sometimes we miss things. Uh, but normally with you know a big telescope you can go out and you can literally just see what's there. You can go and design an experiment to figure out an amazing things and we do that in science all the time. So the fact that you suddenly lose a triple seven over the Indian Ocean seems kind of ridiculous, but you know, we don't normally have a lot of reason to look at the South Indian Ocean because quite frankly, not much happens there <laughs> of interest. <laughs> and if you're the, even the US government, it's not where you're gonna stick your spy satellites because why would you bother? They don't <laughs> like looking at blank 
ocean any more than anyone else does. So I think in some sense it, it does seem a little ridiculous, but it's you got to be looking for events that just happen, and once they're gone, as like the supernova described earlier, it's gone, it's behind you in time, and you don't get that back. Mm, probably also demonstrates the importance of capturing the public imagination, that if you've got a story to tell, which you will have through the SKA, yep. it's vitally important to galvanise public attention on that. Yeah, up here. Thank you very much. Um, can you, these, the SKA is going to use a significant amount of energy, I take it. Can you sort of expand on that and where is it coming from? What are the, what are the uh, implications of that, please? Oh, that's such a good question. It's one of my favourite bits of the square kilometre array is the problem of powering uh, the computing in particular. So it's not just moving the antennas around, it's actually powering the supercomputers, powering the data transport that's the real challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge in a number of ways because the, the SKA in Australia is, is actually deliberately put somewhere where power isn't. It's a long way from any power generation. And one of the commitments of the International SKA project is to investigate ways in which the SKA can be as sustainable as possible in its power utilization. Uh, right now, and this is probably, can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I tell you all a secret at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> only tell ten, only tell ten of yeah. your best friends, okay? <laughs> one of the things that we're currently looking at is actually removing the need to have lots of uh, power-hungry computers actually out at the remote site and actually move the data in its rawest form back to somewhere where there's a power grid and then use something like the city of Geraldton, which in itself has uh, positioning itself as a, an energy centre in terms of renewables and sustainable energy for Australia. Geraldton's the windsurfing capital mm -hmm. of Australia, for example. So something like uh, the SK, which needs base load power, uh, wind generation supporting that through those forms of energy, researching into novel forms of battery technology in order to support the uh, observing throughout the night when solar photovoltaics don't work terribly well, and ways of uh, sensible energy management. The cooling I talked about, the POSI supercomputer, we're using shallow aquifer cooling, uh, which means that you don't evaporately cool uh, supercomputers and with the consequent water losses, particularly for Western Australia, that's very important. So the whole ecosystem around generation, around storage, around transmission and management is a really, really complex problem. And if you can solve that for something of the scale of the SKA, which is of the order of 10 megawatts, you solve that for small isolated communities, you solve that for mines. So this is a really challenging thing. It's one of the areas where our colleagues in Germany, uh, again, the, the Max Planck Institute for uh, solar energy systems are particularly interested in using the SK as an exemplar of the type of power challenges that are actually not just applicable to radio astronomy, but applicable to society more generally. Mm. Fascinating question, actually. Yep. There. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm actually from the British High Commission, so I was going to say thank you for the um, plug earlier for the, um, the UK contribution. I didn't plant that, um, but I think it was £119 million um, pounds that Mr Willits announced a couple of weeks ago. Um, my question, though, was about the importance of the global club, uh, collaboration. I mean, you talked about the massive amounts of data and scientists and uh, astronomers in over 10 countries looking at this. How is the, this sort of data going to be put at the disposition of the different people? I mean, are you going to have different groups of, sci uh, of scientists in different countries working on different projects all at the same time with sort of data beamed around the world? It's, a, it's an excellent question. And, and at the moment in the world, particle physicists, for example, and astronomers, the way that they operate is very, very different. Um, particle physicists tend to work in huge collaborations because they've had things like CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and if you look at their research papers, they will have the first three pages will just be a list of author names. So the people getting the appropriate people doing the work, getting the appropriate positions must be a very difficult thing to do. Um, in astronomy, often we will still um, just apply for a telescope time with, us, with one or two other colleagues, maybe a small team of scientists, and then we'll get the telescope to observe what we're interested in, look at the data and, and just publish that ourselves. But we're moving into the particle physics domain now. Because of this big data challenge, because of the international nature of the project, you know, we are Getting, we are getting good practice with this now, with the ASCAP project, for example. So when, in 2009, we offered the ASCAP telescope as a concept uh, to the scientific community, internationally, over 600 
astronomers applied to be part of the science teams which would be doing the major surveys with ASCAP. Um, so just, just for one Pathfinder telescope, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of scientists around the world working together in teams which are focused on specific scientific questions. Uh, and the way that that is organized um, is, is helping us build up those networks, those conferences, those teleconference, um, video conference facilities. You know, the, the, the sort of change in culture that scientists need over the next decade or two to get to the stage where we can have some kind of maybe not open access, but uh, a virtual observatory. In other words, a repository of the data, the data products, the images, the, the, um, the information, huge tables of billions of galaxies, their positions, their velocities, their cross identifications with other wavelengths, what, what, what their properties are, all those things will be in a virtual observatory. In other words, you, you will interact with a computer database as an astronomer rather than going to a telescope pointing it at your object of interest. So the way we're doing astronomy is changing fundamentally because of the huge international nature of these projects and the huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think, yes. You, um, you say you've got an accurate um, estimate of the um, length of time the universe has been in existence and that you'll be able to look further and f further back in time with this SKA than anything else. Um, does there come a finite limit? Is there a point where you'll say, now we can see everything, we don't need to build anymore? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, so there is a finite volume you can see, thanks to the, uh, the fact that we only look out 13.8 billion years in all directions. <laughs> However, in the same sense that I can see all the volume, there are things uh, that are faint, and you need a bigger and bigger telescope to see fainter and fainter. So you will always be able to uh, build a telescope that will see more and more things. Now, at some point, maybe the things you're seeing are small and uninteresting, but on the other hand, the Earth's probably pretty interesting, especially when you haven't seen an Earth. And we're a long ways from being able to, you know, image things to that level. So, although you'll see all of the real estate, you won't see all the features. It's sort of like, you know, when you go onto Google Earth and you're looking around and you realize you're in a place where the satellite coverage is very poor and it's all blurry. But then you can zoom in the middle of Canberra and you can, you know, almost read your mailbox number on it. So, that's sort of the, the analogy. Okay, here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the computing power, um, I use Boink uh, doing some computing power for the Skynet uh, projects through Curtin. Is that a possibility for some data coming out of the SKA? That's a really good idea. I mean, I think SK hasn't really thought deeply about how it's operating mode. But the use of citizen science, if you like, in terms of that democratization of science, is something that's very uh, high in my, in, my, in my list of to-dos with the SKA. Uh, uh, the, question, the, the person at the back asked earlier about storing the data. There may be ways in which we can farm out data globally uh, to, to people that will store data and then analyze data for us. I'm a little bit cautious about some of these things in terms of managing expectations. I don't know how many people ran SETI at home uh, for some time. It was download a bit of SETI and discover an alien. Not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if they had, you'd know. be... Yeah, you'd <laughs> <laughs> so you'd be in your words if someone had discovered it. Oh, I, yeah, so if someone I, in Waniassa had found presence of, you know... <laughs> oh, yes, if, if I told you, I had to have to kill you. I know, I know. I know. Uh, but I, I do think, look, it's a fantastic idea, and I think it's certainly something that the SK should look at in terms of actually streaming data out to the rest of the world and actually getting people in their homes to actually define credible and, and well-posed well -posed questions. Mm. We, we're just juggling with our microphones a little bit, but I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, Katrina? I, I get a feeling that in this room full of 300 people, we have a pretty captive audience. I don't think there's anyone who's anti-SKA in here. But I'd like all three of you, Brian, Brian and Lisa, to address the question of justifying a really very large amount of expenditure on a project like this. When there are people waiting in hospital queues, people in Australia losing their jobs with 
Ford or Holden or Toyota. I, I'm sorry to bring it back down to the crushing reality, but I think it's a question we have to address. Yep. I, we'll let youth go first. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Was it youth before beauty? I can't remember. Yeah, anyway, before beauty, yes. yeah, something like that. Okay, that's a fantastic question. I'm, uh, I work for CSIRO, so the taxpayer, um, of which I'm one, um, pays for this and pays for my salary as well. Um, you mentioned people waiting in hospital queues, and that's a really, um, that's a really important point because what are they waiting for? Well, they might be waiting to use a, an MRI scanner or a CAT scanner. They may be waiting um, to have a mammogram. Um, all, of, all of the technologies that we use in, in modern medicine, some of the, um, the, the scanners and so on, are based on particle physics and our elementary knowledge of physics, which is caused by physicists understanding how the universe works. Some of our medical imaging techniques, which you're able to find um, objects, let's say, in, in mammograms. Um, those technologies um, were developed in part by scientists working on, let's say, astronomical imaging or other scientific imaging. So the, the things that we're doing, you can't separate one from the other. And I think um, it's really important to understand that, that continued work on science and technology benefits society as a whole. Uh, and I can't ever see anyone giving a good argument against that. Um, what we do is not directly relevant, perhaps, when you look at it in black and white. I'm looking at a star, and I'm going to invent um, a wonderful medical scanner. Nobody looks at it that way. But when I look at the sky every five seconds, and I see this really strange signal, and we go and investigate it, and we see a whole new level of physics that we'd never thought of before, then that, in turn, enables us to invent the next amazing cure for something, or the am next amazing a level of technology that benefits everyone. So it's really the application of science to society um, that has enriched our lives, that has led to a longer lifespan, and the ability to, for me to fly here this morning and to get home safely. And this is absolutely the answer that's about finding out things so that, because we don't know what we can know. And right. this is the quest for human knowledge in its purest form, isn't it? Yeah, Brian Schmidt? Glad I get to go second. Well, I'm sorry, let's just say I'm the oldest, I think. Uh, so, <laughs> but to you, I look younger. I know, Brian. Thanks. So, uh, Just go to the <laughs> So, the, uh, you know, I always look at science as an investment in the future. And right now, you could ask how many of, you know, Australians would actually be putting money in their superannuation, even though they all know they need it. You know, do you invest in your superannuation? The answer is, oh, no, I'll let it slide. I'll pay the bills today. You need to do both. And, you know, society has gone through a, an experiment of not investing in the future. It was known as the Dark Ages. We didn't do science, and we didn't do anything for 800 years. And I don't think we want to repeat that experiment. So we need to invest in science so that in the future there are new ideas percolating which turn into, you know, bigger, better things. You cannot just work on only the problems of today. If you do, it's a false economy because you end up essentially stealing the ideas of the future generations. It is incredibly selfish uh, for the current generation only to invest in the present because it robs your kids and your grandkids of their future. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Brian Boyle, last word to you. Oh dear. Um, you know, this is the reason for radio astronomy. It's the bane of radio astronomers' lives, but of course the Wi-Fi technology in it was invented by CSRIO, generated more revenue around the world than you could spend on uh, a dozen SKAs. And I could, you know, I could talk about the children as well in terms of inspiring people, inspiring the next generation. But at the even more detailed level, uh, Katrina, who asked the question, Australia being able to host a global mega science project and the return not only in terms of jobs for people in the operations, but the support communities, not in, only out in the Murchison in Western Australia, but in Perth, is also tremendous, delivering real benefits to Australia. So yes, the, the, ta the intangible benefits are by far the largest. The next Wi-Fi technology, the next Einstein that we inspire as a six-year-old in the SK, but also about the tangible returns, and very real returns to Australia in terms of stimulating computer industry and the manufacturing industry and the energy industry around what I consider to be uh, a project 
that is transformational and on the same scale as something like a Snowy Mountains mm. hydro project. It's, mm. a, it's a generational project, mm. once in a lifetime. Brian told me this morning, I, perhaps you, you will not necessarily have heard this on the radio, but that he was once a dreaming eight-year-old, a dreaming ten-year-old, who wanted to look into the future and see what it would hold. And perhaps that, that your own career trajectory in some ways, Brian, if demonstrates I could, the importance of this. If I, if I can, everything I say is both good and original. Unfortunately, the good bits aren't original and the original <laughs> bits aren't any good. Uh, <laughs> so if I can quote something good from my former boss at Syro, she says, if I want to know the future, I always look at an astronomer. <laughs> well, look, I would like to thank you all very much indeed for being here. This has been, as, as I fully expected it to be, a very engaged and thoughtful and exciting discussion with all of you. And please thank our panel, Professor Brian Boyle, Dr Lisa Harvey-Smith and, and Professor Brian Schmidt.